Today we'll be looking at the idea of death in the early church. The idea represented primarily today through the monuments dedicated to death, the early Christian burial places, and the artwork that is contained within it. The music that you heard to begin this presentation is the medieval hymn Dies Irae, that often was sung at funerals. It looks forward to the final judgment with fear and trembling. It begins a day of wrath that is coming. The way Christians portrayed death in their burial places in the early church was had a different tenor than that. And so we'll be looking at that today. There's also more to be said on death in the early church. One can look at the texts and the preaching and the various other things written about death. That won't be covered in this session. That will have to wait for a future session. Today we're looking really at the material testimony to how early Christians in Rome thought about death. And so come with me down underground to visit these early Roman places. When we look at the evidence of Christian death in the early church, our most tangible remains consist in underground cemeteries that line the roads leading outside of Rome, beginning just outside of the city limits and extending out beyond there. Some word about the practice of this, the history of this. Well, initially, Christians who died in Rome, like St. Peter, St. Paul, were buried along with other Romans, who were not, of course, yet Christian, those we simply refer to as pagan, in burial places all around the city. The, the burial place of St. Paul, the burial, burial place of St. Peter, were simply in those places. These places were known colloquially as necropoli, or a necropolis. The word, of course, comes from the Greek, necropolis, the city of the dead. And it was the Roman custom, and indeed the Roman law, that you could not bury people inside of the city boundaries. And so all of these burial places were found just outside of the city boundaries. As I said, on each of the Roman roads leading out of the city, as you exited the city or entered the city, you would find a band of necropolis that lined the city, circling the city on each of these, these roads. And the more developed form of these necropolis, the necropoli, you can see in the picture there, were actual what looked like houses, townhomes, you might say, mausolea, each owned by a different family, each decorated on the outside with the um, symbols of the family, perhaps a dedication to the family's gods, and inscriptions telling you about the family that is buried there. So if you had any means in Rome, you would have a house in the city of the living, and then you would have a house in the city of the dead for the family that had passed on. The most um, visible evidence of this we can see today is underneath St. Peter's, which is where this picture comes from, in the excavations that were done to find the tomb of St. Peter. And there, there we found, the, the, arche, the archaeologists found a very elaborate necropolis that they, they have been able to excavate so you have a feel for what it was like in the second, third century when it was in use. You can also get a more degraded version of that outside of the ancient Roman port of Ostia, which is another visible place where you can look at what necropolis would have been. Now, there arose the practice in the second, third, fourth, fifth century of being more um, economical, let's say, with space. Because, of course, these mausolea were dedicated to families. And within them, you could fit a lot of people in the family because the, the custom in the early days was, was cremation. After what we call the first century AD, there came to be the, the, the custom among some, particularly some groups, 
of burial, inhumation, as the technical term goes. And the major groups that used these were the, the Jewish community and the Christian community, both of which placing great honor for the bodies of the dead, looking forward to a resurrection of these bodies, were careful not to cremate, but to bury their dead. And when you have burial, you need a lot more space. The problem is, if you're burying, and if you don't have a lot of money, there's not a lot of places to put your bodies. And so the Roman ground came to the rescue, you might say. The ground under Rome is volcanic rock. Tough, as we say in English, or tufa in Italian. It is um, easily excavated, and it hardens upon exposure with air. And so you can dig in there and make a place for the burial of your, your loved ones, your community members. And this is, in fact, what happened. There were um, excavations done under the earth, and these long hallways um, carved out. And along the ha hallways, what formed the walls of the hallways, little niches were cut, just big enough to place a body in. The body was then laid in that little niche, covered with a bit of quicklime to help in decomposition so that the place wouldn't become toxic as you put more and more bodies in there. And then the niche was covered over with a and sealed with usually a terracotta tile. If you were a bit more wealthy, you might seal it with a marble slab, but the most common thing were terracotta tiles. These terracotta tiles are quite useful to historians today and archaeologists because they were made by city um, terracotta works and a tax was placed on them such that each terracotta tile has a stamp in them that, on, on it that shows that the tax was paid but it also dates the tile and gives information on the, the um, people in government at the time so you can know when these tiles were actually um, were actually made, and so you can then come to a logical conclusion about the date of these different tombs from the terracotta tiles that are that are included there. Now the the Christians came up with a new name for the places that they bury. In the early days, when these underground places first began to be used, they were simply called underground necropoli the necropolis above the ground and the necropolis below the ground. But as the time went on, this word seemed to be not quite fitting for the belief of the Christians that these places, according to Christian understanding, were simply a temporary resting place for the dead. Because, of course, soon, we don't know how soon, but soon, Christ will be return, and everyone will be raised. Thus, the Christian conception of death from the beginning was always a very temporary one. And the language that was used on these graves reflected that. You can distinguish between a Christian grave and a pagan grave by that kind of language. If the inscription says, deposited here, or resting here, or rest in peace, then you know this is a Christian grave because it's deposited temporarily. It's resting, ready to wake up when the resurrection comes. And so therefore the whole burial place eventually came to be known not as a necropolis, but a resting place. The word um, that was used came from the Greek word for bed, koime, and it was known then as a comiterion, a cemetery. And so we have these cemeteries that more and more became dedicated to exclusively Christian use. Some of the very early ones have different sorts of uses, a Christian section and other sections. But as Christianity became more and more populous, popular, um, more populous in the city of Rome, and eventually 
took over the whole city by the end of the 5th century, at least officially, these underground cemeteries became exclusively Christian cemeteries. And they were in use until the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries, as they were systematically closed down, and the important bodies in these cemeteries brought into the city of Rome, because these were bodies of martyrs and saints, that people wanted to visit and go on pilgrimage to visit their graves. And so they would had they brought those bodies, as much as they could, into the city of Rome to place within churches in Rome. Because why they do this? Well, from the 6th to the 9th century, uh, the outside areas of the city became more and more dangerous. And the church didn't want people going out to the graves and risking their life because they um, wanted to visit their, their family or the saints or the martyrs, and so they wanted to bring as much as uh, much of them as possible into the city, into the walls, so that they would be safe. And so they were closed and fell out of use, fell out of memory from about the ninth century, well, finally in the ninth century, but gradually up until the ninth century until the time of the Renaissance and the real rediscovery and excavation of these underground cemeteries in the 17th century. Today we call them catacombs, but that's not what they would have been called in the early church. They would have been called underground cemeteries. The reason we call them catacombs is an accident of history, because of the many of them, there are about 60 of these located all around the city of Rome. You can see this map here has some of them in the little square boxes. It shows you where all of these different cemeteries were out on the various roads outside of Rome. Of them, only one was not closed down. The earliest one is the one we call the um, Catacombs of Callisto that seems to have been in use from as early as 230 AD on the property of a, an important person of the church that was later, later became Bishop of Rome, Zephrinius. But the most significant one was another early one from a bit later that we call today the Catacombs of St. Sebastian. Now, why was this the most important one? Well, it is at this cemetery, actually outside of the cemetery, but right near the entrance of it, that an early house was built that was in use through the middle of the third century, and it was in use as a Christian meeting place. And it, it served a particularly important use in the middle of the third century, because it became a focal point for devotion to the great apostles of Rome, Peter and Paul. It is known, was known then, and still known officially today as the Memoria Apostolorum, the place of the memory of the apostles. And it seems that some part of the bodies of Peter and Paul were kept in this house, so that the Christians could go out of, out of town and pray at the graves of Peter and Paul during the time when, in the middle of the third century, Christians were prohibited from praying at the graves. In fact, one pope, Pope Sixtus II, was even put to death because he defied that rule to go and pray in the catacomb of Callistus. And so this place became the place of Peter and Paul. Since it was located at what, what had been a quarry, it was located in a little valley, at a place where there were entrances into the ground, what seemed to be, by the 3rd century, natural entrances, which had one time been used as part of the quarry to go down and quarry this tufa rock out of the ground. This cemetery was not known as the cemetery of St. Sebastian because Sebastian was only added at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the third century, beginning of the fourth century um, there. This 
underground cemetery was called the cemetery in, in the hollows, or in Greek, catacumbas. Kata, at, in, kumbas, these little hall hollows there where you could see these in the ground. As this became the only underground cemetery that was open during the Middle Ages and, and um, later middle, middle Ages, it became known as the cemetery, moving from the Greek to the Latin, ad catacumbas. Therefore, it was known as the catacombs. And then, when others were rediscovered, they were also called catacombs. So, these things are called catacombs by taking the name, the local name of one, and extending it to all. So we call them catacombs today. But just remember that catacomb has no real meaning in, of it, in and of itself, only as a kind of place name, much as um, in the US we call tissues Kleenexes. What would you do at these cemeteries? Well, of course, you'd bury the dead, but you'd also want to go and visit the dead. It was an ancient Roman custom to frequently visit your dead family, to maintain the contacts not, with, not only with the dead family, but with the, the, the dead family and the household gods and the traditions of the family. And so you would go out to the mausolea, to the necropolis, um, to have a picnic. These picnics were known as refreshing times that you could spend there. In Latin, refrigerium. And you would offer a bit of wine, a bit of chicken, to your dead relatives, um, while you had your own meal. This practice was a fundamental cultural practice that naturally Christians would want to go and visit the graves as well, but, but, but then Christians, just like they transformed the, the idea of the, resting place, of the dead place into a resting place, they transformed the idea of this refrigerium from one of communion with the, the dead that are, that are gone to the place of the dead, with communion with the dead who are part of the church, who we still pray with every time we pray, and who we will rejoin soon in the resurrection. And so, for, therefore, these refrigeria, which is the plural of refrigerium, became a, a, a prayer. And indeed, it, it seems that at least sometimes masses were offered in these refrigeria so that the dead could join in with the living at the place of their burial. It's one of the, the reasons why when churches were built over these tombs, they also became the place of worship, and the altar would enclose the body of the most important martyr of the, of the space, so that the body of the martyr sanctifies the altar itself. In these cemeteries, when we go down there, we find inscriptions on these terracotta slabs and on the marble slabs, and the inscriptions are in the language of the people, and the Christian community in Rome was primarily Greek-speaking up until the end of the second century AD, and then became Latin-speaking, so we have inscriptions in Greek and Latin in these, in these places. And sometimes even the curious thing where you have a Greek inscription in the Latin alphabet, so you see the, the kind of mix of the two. Of these 60 or so underground cemeteries, catacombs, there are only a few that are open to the public, a few that have been excavated to the point where they can allow public visits. In other words, the bodies have been moved to a lower level and the um, entryways and the pathways have been made safe enough for people to go down and visit them. There are uh, three that are opened in the south part of the city, the Catacombs of Sebastian, the Catacombs of Callisto, and the Catacombs of, of Domitilla. There is one, well, really two in the north, the Catacombs of Priscilla and the Catacombs of Agnes, and there is one to the east, the Catacombs of, of St. Lawrence. Other than that, you need special permission from the Commission for Sacred Archaeology to be able to visit these other underground cemeteries. The Catacomb of Priscilla is a particularly interesting one. 
It was built on the oldest road that exists in Rome, the Via Salaria, which existed before Rome became even a major city, because it was the road used by people in these central parts of Italy to come down to the sea to get their salt. Salaria means um, salty. So the ancient Via Salaria was the salt road that ran from the mountains down to the sea, and it became incorporated into the Roman road system. This um, place along the Via Salaria held a home, a villa, of an important Roman family. There were lots of these villas outside of the city of important families that would be used to go out during nice, nice days to get some fresh air, especially during the hot summer months. And this villa along the Via Salaria um, was owned by a, an important Roman woman by the name of Priscilla. And it seems that um, she had become Christian and began hosting Christians at her house, perhaps as a regular worship space, although being outside of the city, that's not not that likely, but certainly um, as a, a regular host of Christians. And then she decided to bequeath her property to the Christian community. And so the church received this property and began digging out, going from the basement of the house out into the gra surrounding ground to dig out this cemetery. And indeed, this one exists on two levels, which was the normal way of doing things. Once you extend it out in, on one level, and you either went too far enough, um, then farther than you wanted to go anymore, or just simply wanted more space, you would go down to a second level, which is what happened here. But you could also go down a third level. We have those in other places as well. What is the significance of the catacomb? Well, Num two things. Number one, it was the burial place of several martyrs and seven popes. You can see them there on the screen. The most um, noteworthy one in the history of the church of, of these seven is St. Sylvester, who was the pope when Constantine was putting in his program of building for the church. So he is most um, the pope most known as connected with Constantine. <laughs> He's no longer buried here in the catacomb of Priscilla. Um, his body was moved into town, into the church that now is bears his name, the, the Church of Sylvester. The second um, interesting thing about this catacomb, which makes it well worth visiting, is that it has the best art preserved of these public catacombs, the ones that you can visit. And so it's got some very nice examples of early Christian art, and we can then see um, again, what, how the Christians saw death. And so what I want to do now is go through some of this art, much of the art from the catacomb of Priscilla, but also some of the art from the other catacombs to talk about what the idea of death was in these early days. We already talked about the main feature, which is, was that death was temporary, transitional. And the art will help us to look at some other things. There are two different ways of burying people that we find in these underground cemeteries. The normal way, is what I've talked about before, are these little niches, which are called in Latin loculi. Locus, locus, loculus which is just a little place. A locus, a loculus, is a little place. And this is a, a part of the pathways in the catacombs of Priscilla. And you can see they're lined like all these underground cemeteries with these little niches, these loculi, for the dead. These would have all been filled and sealed. The, they're not filled now because they have moved the bodies down to a, a lower level or a further level that are out of, ac out of uh, access to the public coming in, but they would have been filled and sealed. And then there, there are also rooms, rooms that were known as cubic or cubiculum. These cubiculi were little areas within these underground spaces that were dedicated either to a single family or uh, just a group of significant burials. We have one in the catacombs of, of Callistus that's dedicated to bishops of Rome, second, uh, third, sorry, third century bishops of Rome, popes, 
Um, and these are also often quite highly decorated. You see this one is covered with stucco and frescoed. This one here, you can see the art much more clearly. Um, it's covered in the white stucco and painted with some peacocks and reclining people and seasons and all kinds of nice things like that. Um, this one honors the burial in that arch. The arch in Latin is called an arco solia, it, like, uh, imaging the rising of the sun, which is also an image of resurrection. The sun rises, and this was taken as, it is, of course, the renewal of the day, but Christians would take it as the renewal of life. New life coming into the world, which will come when Christ returns. And so the, the burial place of the important martyr would be in one of, underneath one of these arcosolia, and in the space there, which you see now is all filled in, there would have been an open space for a sarcophagus or coffin to be placed. Um, to honor this person there. And you see above the arch, there are two peacocks. Peacocks are also an image of resurrection. It's an image that was used by the ancient Romans, pre-Christian Romans, as a symbol of immortality. And the Christians took it over as a symbol of resurrection. We have one of these cubiculi in um, the catacombs of Priscilla. And this, like the one I just showed in the picture, is also very highly decorated. And the images have been recently restored, maybe 20 years ago. And since they're done in fresco, in other words, the paint is put onto the plaster before it's dry, the colors are still quite vibrant today, even as they were in the second half of the third century when it was painted. Now, this crypt is dedicated to a single woman, because she's the main figure there, and probably her family as well. It's known as the Crypt of the Velata because the main image that you see there in the, in the slide is a veiled woman. Now, most women um, in the early church would have been veiled. Most Rome, women in ancient Rome would have been veiled, so it's not that she's a particularly veiled woman, but it's just that there's the artwork of a woman with a veil, and so her name is given to this crypt by the archaeologists and scholars today not by the people then. Here we have another image of the early church. There is the woman herself on our left getting married and on our right nursing the baby. So it tells some of the story of her life and the importance of families as part of the early Christian community. In the center, though, we have the woman now, as you would visit her, in the grave site. What is she doing? She's got her hands up in the air. This is a position that we call the orante position or the orans position. And we know it to be a position of prayer. This was the standard way that you would pray at Mass in the early church or when you would pray in any way, in any case. Most of the time you would celebrate the liturgy standing and when time came for prayers, you would raise your arms in prayer, like she's doing there. Why is this not a picture of her at prayer during her life? Why did I say it's a picture of her now in death? Well, of course, it could be both, but it certainly is an image of her now in death, because what is the person doing between death and resurrection? What are they doing? Well, they're not wandering around the underworld, chatting with the gods, dancing out on the Elysian fields or something. They are being held in life by God himself, held in the presence of Christ, and doing only one thing, praying. Because, of course, you don't have a body. It's just simply the soul. And the soul is awaiting resurrection. And in this non-material space, there's only one thing that we can do between death and resurrection, and that is pray. We can pray to be cleansed of all of the remains of the effect of sin that we had when we died. And being perfected, we can pray with the church for the needs of the church, which is certainly what Christians saw their dead predecessors doing. That every time we celebrate Mass, 
we join with not just the people here, not just Christ himself, but all the angels and saints, all of those who populate the heavenly spaces, the angels, and all those who have gone before us, because they are there praying with the church. And this is an image also of that. The woman praying, and since she's a woman, she also can be an image of the church praying. So you come here and you remember that all of the dead here around you are praying. And this gives us uh, another um, entryway into the experience of what going down into these burial places would have been like in the early church. First of all, there would have been no lights, of course, because of no electricity. The, these places would have been all lit by small oil lamps that would have been placed all along the pathway or carried, depending on how, um, how busy it was at the time. Most times probably would be, be carried in. And so you'd go down into this dark passageway with a few oil lamps to find the places that you wanted to remember, the places of your family or the saints or the martyrs, and so you'd go down under there. Today that might sound spooky to us, because we don't really we don't really like death today. We try to avoid it at all costs. The early Christian idea of death, though, is a hopeful one. Christ has conquered death. The resurrection of Christ shows that death no longer has any power. And so even though you might grieve the loss of a loved one when they die, this grief is in hope. It's in hope that the person is not lost, that the person is now with Christ and indeed will be resurrected on the last day. And so the journey down into these dark cemeteries would have been a journey of joy, not of fear and not of spookiness. Your experience would have been an experience of going down into the choirs of heaven and praying with them as you were down there. And again, we see above the woman's head, the peacock, this image of life, resurrection, that she's indeed hoping for. Her eyes are raised in that direction. This crypt was discovered by one of the great excavators of the catacombs, Antonio Bozio. And you can even find his name ins uh, inscribed on the wall here in the catacombs, um, kind of gr ancient graffiti showing that he indeed was there with the date that he visited. The crypt of the Velata is, uh, the Velata is decorated on the ceiling as well as, and, and the walls. Um, some of it's been lost, but much of it is still there. If you look up, you see an image of the Good Shepherd with pheasants, again, treats as symbols of life. We have over to the right image of the book from the book of Daniel of the three young men in the furnace. On the left, we have Moses striking the rock to get water. And we see there in the corners a dove with an olive branch. Now, what is, what is a dove with the olive branch telling us? Well, the dove with the olive branch, where do you find that? What, what is that a quotation from? It's a quotation from the book of Genesis. Because Noah, of course, after the flood, he's not knowing when the waters are going to subside. And so he's waiting and looking, and all he sees is water. And so he sends out a dove. And the dove doesn't, doesn't land, so it comes back to him. But then he sends out the dove again after some time, and the dove comes back with an olive branch. And this is the sign to Noah that the waters are going down, that the flood is over, that we just have to wait a little while longer and we'll be able to land and enjoy the earth again. Well, why is that here? Is it just a memory of a Bible story? No, it's precisely the understanding of death because the resurrection of Jesus is the dove with the olive branch. It is the sign that the great flood, death itself, which came into the world because humanity cut itself off from God by sin, which is now drowning us, destroying us. We begin to die as soon as we begin to grow. Death eats away at us. But this, the resurrection of Christ shows that God has conquered death. 
that death is on its way out. We just have to wait a little while for the fullness of evil to be conquered, and then we can enjoy the earth again. Because there will be the resurrection and the new heaven, the new earth, and we can once again enjoy the richness of the world around us. So the dove with the olive branch is a symbol of Christ, and it's a symbol of Christ's work of the defeat of death. Now, if you look up to the ceiling, you see the image of the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd is an image like the peacock that was not originally Christian. It's not an originally Christian idea. It was taken over from the non-Christian Romans. It was a, a death image of theirs as well. Because for them it imaged the, the dead person being carried into the underworld. Um, for the Christians, of course, due to the predominance of shepherd imagery uh, connected to Jesus in the New Testament, and then through that connected to Jesus in looking back to the Old Testament, it was a, immediately a, sim a symbol that um, Christians wanted to use. And so Christians would understand this image that you see there is Christ carrying the person during this time of death. It could be a lamb, and this image it looks like it's a goat, but carrying the the um, a person through death to new life. It's a similar meaning with the three young men in the furnace, because in this image we have in the book of Daniel, remember these three um, young men were thrown into a furnace because they refused to worship the emperor Nebuchadnezzar. And even though they were thrown into this burning hot furnace, the guards looked in and saw them quite happy as if they're in a garden, speaking with another person there in the furnace. The flames of the furnace didn't touch them. Why is it here? Well, again, it's an image of uh, the understanding of death, that if you die in Christ, death does not destroy you. You are held in existence by the love of God, and you are in death praying. You see how they have their hands raised in prayer. And so you're there in death. Death should be destroying you, but it's not, because Christ is protecting you. And so these three young men are the image of the people that are dead in Christ, awaiting resurrection. In the same way, the sacrifice of Isaac shows the offering of God himself, of his own son, for our salvation. So it's the connection of the Old Testament to the New Testament and, and the celebration of that, that Christ himself has conquered death. Similarly, we don't have this in Priscilla, but in other places, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel is there in the lion's den just as the dead person is in death. The lions, though, don't eat him. Just as death doesn't destroy or eat away at the Christian who is dead. And you see this is um, Daniel's precisely the dead person because he has no clothes on. And the lions are there playing with him rather than eating him. A very elaborate space in the catacombs of Priscilla is, on the, is in the basement area of the house of Priscilla. There are several spaces in this basement area. It's known archaeologically as a cryptoporticos because it's a um, an arch space underneath the ground, which would have been used as any Roman houses were, places to go during the hot summer days to get a little bit cooler, places to store your wine, um, and things like that. But we see that this room of the Cryptoporticos was turned into a chapel, a place to gather, to celebrate a meal, that refuge, refrigerium, refrigerium that I mentioned before. It's unclear whether they celebrated the full proper mass there, but certainly they would gather to celebrate the meal and pray with the dead as they were there. It's called the Greek Chapel because there's an inscription in Greek on the side, and so it's just called that because they found an inscription in Greek. But of course, this is where Christians would come and gather in prayer for the dead that were there in the cemetery, convinced that they, of course, the dead were gathering in prayer with them and probably celebrate. The, the Eucharist there. 
And we have some very important images here as well. You can see straight ahead over the arch is Moses striking the rock. Another image of life, death, life out of death. The rock can't give any water. Moses strikes the rock and the power of, of the Holy Spirit opens the rock and water springs forth. In the same way, Christ's descent into hell frees the, the realm of the dead to be the presence of the Spirit so that the dead are now with Christ. And again, to the, the right-hand side, you have three young men in the furnace as well. This time they're kind of in a fire, not inside a box furnace, but they're there as well. On the arch of this chapel shows what would have been done there, the breaking of the bread. This meal, this refrigerium that was celebrated there in the space. And of course, what, what, what do you eat at a Christian meal? Well, primarily you eat bread and drink wine. There's um, baskets of bread lying on the side there. And the breaking of the bread is the, the, the high point of the Eucharistic liturgy, which is why it seems that there was the Eucharist celebrated here, at least certainly this is what is imaged in the, in the painting, in the fresco. This is also an image of what Tertullian referred to as an agape feast, a feast of love that Christians could gather together to celebrate. And so it seems there that there are women and men both gather, gathered around, possibly evoking Priscilla herself. The Latin phrase for breaking of the bread is fraxio panis, so this is what this fresco is called. And there we have, a little bit more clearly, Moses with the rock, the three young men in the furnace. And you can see up to the left, one of the four circles on the ceiling, which are the four seasons. So here underground, you have the image of the four seasons, evoking again the idea of resurrection, the new heaven, new earth. Along the walls at one portion of the chapel is the story of Susanna and the elders which is an account of the, the condition of the Christians in the early church. Because, of course, Susanna was um, accused of seducing the elders, even though it was the elders themselves who um, peeked in on her while she was bathing and refused their advances. And then they accused her of trying to make advances towards them, and they were eventually found out and uh, punished for that. This is a, a sign of hope of Christians in Rome towards the Roman society, which they felt was unjustly condemning them for celebrating in ways that were quite, number one, harmless to Roman social structures, but also beneficial if the Romans would only listen. And then we also have the earliest image of the three wise men that, that exists today there in the Greek chapel. We have them in three different colors because they, traditionally they came from three different places in the East. And so this shows the, um, the Gentile world coming to Christ, of which many of the, the Christians who were buried here would have been precisely that. Gentiles would come to Christ. So that's why this is there. There's the raising of Lazarus, again, life from death. And there is a very um, not well-preserved image of the animal that from the, first, from the end of the first century AD, was seen as a, a particular symbol of resurrection. And that's the legendary phoenix. So there's a little bit of phoenix there in the chapel. We also have the oldest image of the Madonna and Child that still exists. This comes from the late second or early third century, and it's not in very good condition, as you can see in the, in the image there. It's a fresco. Um, next to a very important grave, we're not really sure whose grave, but there's a highly stuccoed grave with a good shepherd also on it there. And this is um, painted into the corner. It shows Mary with the Christ child and a figure next to them, which it seems to be the prophet Balaam from the book of Numbers, who talked about a star rising in Judah. And you can see a star that he's pointing to in the bigger version of this painting. So the earliest image of the Madonna and Child that, that we continue to have today, we find in the catacombs of Priscilla. 
Another common image that you see around these catacomb inscriptions and burial art is the fish and the anchor. The anchor shows that if you are grounded in Christ, you are again, the waters won't, won't overcome you, you'll be, you'll be fixed and stay with Christ. It's also an, another way of showing the cross because the cross was not used in Christian art until the fifth century. And so earlier on, you could draw an anchor that kind of gave you an idea of a cross. So you'd have the anchor there. And the fish, the fish um, was a symbol, of course, of people who were caught by the net of Christ. This fish is caught by the anchor there. We are just kind of swimming along, not knowing who we are until Christ calls us and brings us to him. The fish is also a symbol of the Eucharist because of the, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. And it also came to be an image of, so it's always image of Christians or Christ himself or the incarnation in the Eucharist. It also came to be an, a way of talking about the heart of the Christian faith, a confession of faith. Because if you take the Greek word for fish, and again, many of these early Christian Romans were Greek speakers, the Greek word for fish, if you look at at the capital letters there on the left, and you read them down, it is ichthus, that's fish in Greek. So if you take each one of those letters, these would be single letters in Greek, the ch is the, the ki, the chi, looks like an x, and the th is the theta, looks like an o with a line through it. They spell out a quick confession of faith. Jesus Christos Theo Huyos Soter, Jesus Christ, Son of God, and Savior, or Jesus Christ is God's Son and our Savior. So the ichthus then could stand for that little confession of faith. Sarcophagi became um, to be came to be used. Sorry, came to be used by more um, wealthy Christians, beginning in around the fourth century. And we have lots of examples of these. There are several muse um, museum sections dedicated to them. There's the Museo Pio Cristiano in the Vatican Museums. There's the um, Monte Martini Museum in Rome and other places where you can find sarcophagi both from the pagan world and from the Christian world. This is a very elaborate one that probably came from the catacomb of Domitila. It's from the mid-fourth century and it shows scenes from the Passion of Christ. So there's Christ in each of these scenes um, one of them carrying the cross, one being led by the centurion, one be with the crown of thorn thorns being placed on his head. And in the center, you have, an, um, which again, are later imagery. We don't find that so much in the older catacomb art. But as these um, this art forms begin to get elaborated on with sarcophagi, it gets more and more detailed. And in the center, you have the cross itself with the guards by the tomb sleeping there underneath. You have the doves again with the olive branch. And at the top, you have a, a symbol that we do find in a lot of the catacomb art. And that is what we call the Cairo. It is the, those two letters, um, uh, uh, the CH, which is the X, and the R, which looks like a P in Greek. The CH and the R are the first two letters in the word Christ, Christos. And so this is a, a shortened version of the name Christ, which came to be a symbol for Christ. It's called the, the monogram of Christ. And so you see that Cairo a lot of times in these early burial places like this one here. This is a tomb cover. Um, it has the Cairo. And on either side, the other Greek letters, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet, in this place reversed with the omega first and the alpha second, but sometimes you'd have the alpha first and the omega second. The barrel is a barrel of wine. The wine was a symbol of, of um, pagan Roman burial, but the, Roman, the Christians also took it over as a sign of the abundance of life that awaits in the resurrection and the blood of Christ that we celebrate in the Eucharist. A very elaborate piece of art um, we find under St. Peter's Basilica in that necropolis that you find in the Vatican Hill down there. Um, and this is a mosaic. One of the 
the only mosaics or the one of the few mosaics that we find in these early Christian burial places. And this one is of Apollo riding on the chariot of the sun. But you notice the head of Apollo, of Apollo is in the shape of a cross. So this seems to be a, an image of Apollo that's been reimagined as Christ. Christ, the true sun, not the sun that gives light in the in the physical world, but the one who governs the universe, Christ himself, is Apollo. And so this is a, a brief introduction to um, the earliest kind of Christian art that we have, which is this Christian burial art, and a window through that art into the understanding of death in the early church. We can sum it up um, in a, just a few words. Number one, the Christians understood death to be not the end of the person, but a temporary stop between the life of the person and the eternal life of the person that will come at the end of time with the second coming of Christ. Because the Christian hope is that the person's life, which is destroyed by death, the body is destroyed, the soul would be destroyed, but because of the love of God, the soul is kept in existence by God. And because of the death of Christ, we are now freed from death. Baptism washes us of that permanence of death. And we are being prepared for a new life in which our bodies will be resurrected. And we will live again as of our full selves when history has come to a completion, when all of evil has been conquered. This confidence in the face of death led people to dedicate themselves to Christ regardless of any of the troubles that came to them. And so they were not eager to be martyred usually, but, but often willing to be put to death to stand up for their Christian faith. And these were called witnesses to Christ, martyrs in Greek, because they witnessed to Christ even in death. Because they did not fear death, at least ultimately, because even though death is scary, they know that it's not the end. And so they die into Christ in hope, in hope of the resurrection. And these burial places witness to that hope of the resurrection in their temporariness, in the language that they use about resting place, not necropolis, and in the imagery that they use, because all of this imagery points to the fact that life has changed because of Christ, that death has changed because of Christ, and that even though death is not a nice place, it's still a threatening place, we don't have any activity in death other than praying, praying with the church, being prayed for by the church, but that soon, soon and very soon, as the hymn says, this temporary stage of death will be over and we will live again in our full bodily state in a renewed earth where everything that is good is now good for all eternity. And so the Christian burial places become a sign of hope. Mm -hmm.